Hey there, lady. Hi, Kelly. Good morning. Yay. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me and with our group here. Yeah, totally. I'm excited to chat and to know. get more involved with the group. Yeah, it's super fun. Um, so I've been following you for how many years ago did we meet at the Portland travel show, which only happened one time? <laughs> yeah, the short-lived show. I think that was about three and a half years ago. Three and a half years ago. And that's when you had just started your company. Tell us a little bit about um, what you were doing and kind of what the, give us the gist of what you were working on. Yeah, the, the quick skinny. Um, so the company is Living Big Travel and I actually started it, I guess, about six years ago. So I had, I was kind of in my first two years, I think, when we met. And uh, when it started, it was all about hosting small groups of women on trips all over the world. Uh, the groups are about 10 to 12, so they're not, not huge. Um, and then after about the fourth year of running tours, I started offering custom travel design. So those are, um, you know, where I'm in a, more of a planner capacity, but still like designing trips in a really hands-on uh, way that my clients were experiencing if they had been on my group trips. Um, so I started uh, my first trip, it was just like one trip a year. You know, I'm sure like a lot of people, I was like, scared out of my mind the night before everyone arrived going oh my god what the hell am I doing <laughs> and then every year I just kind of started adding more and more uh, trips and then um, you know the last couple of years started working uh, and training more hosts that would also lead trips uh, for the business um, and so I think at our biggest year I think we had about 12, uh, 12 tours that we've done. That's awesome. It's so crazy and so cool to watch you just like explode and kick uh, it, you know? It, 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 you know, I look back now, I'm sure a lot of people have this moment where you look back and you're like, how did that happen? Or that seems scary. Or like, what, how did I get here? And, and it's all kind of a blur, you know, like you just do the best you can every day yeah. trying to like figure out how to, I think, marry what you want your life to look like, how much travel you want, how much flexibility you want, how much money you need, blah, 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 with like kind of what your audience and, and what the market demands. And then it, it kind of just keeps flowing. And so I think that's kind of how it kept growing. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit about what I wanted to talk about today. It's like from the first trip to, you know, to today, like the stages of growth that you underwent and like the moves that you made that you felt maybe were really instrumental in that and then, you know, moves that you made that didn't really help very much. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of those too. <laughs> Your first tour was in 2014. Yeah. And where did you go? Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Cool. Yeah. And so from that trip <laughs> until now, I mean, you must have like a million lessons learned. <laughs> so many. So many. I mean, like, there's, um, I, I think part of it is you just start to see more and more. So like, I'm not as shocked or freaked out or like really thrown off my rocker when things happen or when clients do weird things or flights get canceled, delays, hotels lose reservations, drivers don't show up. It's kind of like when it happens now, I mean, there's always things that you know, I don't mean to say like, there's things that don't show up, but when those things happen and those X factors happen, it's kind of like, all right, I've done this before, you know, all right, well, here's what you do. And that, I think that's just true for any traveler that, you know, you just get better at navigating trains and, tra you know, transacting. And same thing with hosting. I think like you just get more um, experience that makes it like more efficient, more turnkey, and also add more value um, to, to your clients. Mm -hmm. What was the first tour that you sold out completely? Um, actually, the first one. The first oh one to Costa Rica. Gosh. Yeah, That's I had, um, it was funny because I, so I, I come from the corporate marketing world, um, and I had uh, quit a full-time job. I worked at Tillamook, the dairy company. Um, I was a brand manager there for, I think I'd been there for like three or four years, and I was just like burnt out. I mean, I think a similar story, a lot of it, you know, we we're just like, I'm tired of working for someone else. I'm tired of the grind. I think like, Especially, I think, in marketing, when you get higher up in management, you get a lot further from the people you serve because you're, like, in strategy meetings and budgets and, you know, PowerPoint. So I just was, I, like, wasn't enjoying it. Um, and so I did take a sabbatical of about six months and ended up not going back to work there and um, tried, like, a whole bunch of different stuff. Like, I met, actually, <laughs> when the coffee shop we met at a few weeks ago, I, like, worked there for a while. I tried working at a travel agency. I started doing freelance work. And then one of the things I tested doing was leading a trip. And like, I had never 
organized group travel, but when I was on my own long trip, I kept a blog and I would just write up a whole bunch of random stuff. And then people started responding, being like, hey, can I meet up with you? And at first I was like, well, I don't even know you. Like, why would you want to meet up with me? That was like before that was like a thing, you know, yeah. like before Girls Love Travel helped facilitate that and mm -hmm. uh, before meet up and stuff. So anyway, that was kind of the seed of the idea. Um, and I had been a producer um, at a big event marketing agency. So like, I feel like that kind of helped me learn how to structure schedules, manage vendors, create budgets, timelines, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so that part didn't seem scary. So I just decided to put a trip together. Um, I'd traveled to Costa Rica a number of times before. So I felt pretty confident um, that I knew where I wanted to take people. And so like the, the thought process was, really like if I were to revisit this country for the first time, what would the trip look like? Like where would I want to spend time and how would I move through the country in a way that would allow me to see and do as much as I wanted to in an efficient way. Um, and so that was really the premise of it. Um, at the time I didn't have a website. I just still, well, I had a blog, but you know, it wasn't like a full service website. Um, and so I think I like, I think I might have like even used PowerPoint. I can't remember, but like I just put together like these slides with photos of my past trips to Costa Rica. I had like a sketch of the itinerary. Um, and I'm sure I probably had a few frequently asked questions, maybe a couple terms and conditions. I don't really remember. Um, and it, and I just kind of shared it on Facebook and um, it kind of worked in a good way. And I'm sure we all see this where it's like, you see one person post it on Facebook and then their friends say, I want to go, I want to go. And so it was kind of like that was the situation. Yeah. I think it's kind of how it sold out. Um, but man, I learned a lot. Like I had clients that got robbed on that first trip. Wow. I had, uh, it, like <laughs> so many weird things happen. <laughs> but you know. Did you use an in-country operator or were you doing it like? I did it. And you know, I've never actually used, uh, I mean, I think I've probably done 30, 30 to 40 trips since then. I've never used an inbound full service operator. I've always kind of negotiated with individual um, service providers for like individual services. So, you know, I negotiate direct with each hotel, each driver, tour guide, you know, zip lining tour outfitter, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I found that I get, I think better rates and better service that way. At least that's my perspective. And I find also that I, even though it's more work, I get a lot more personally out of it because I, I now have connections with these people yeah. um, all over the world that I consider as friends and colleagues. Mm -hmm. and now, in the last year that the private travel design uh, side of the business has grown so much, I lean on those relationships every day yeah. to help bring to life the private trips that my clients hire me to plan. So, but, uh, so for like Vietnam, I mean, you're how do you even go about finding like drivers to negotiate with? Like, how would you? Um, well, I just, so I, I hosted a trip to Vietnam last year. And so specifically for that one, um, oftentimes for drivers, I'll hire driver or I'll, I'll hire them through the hotel, mm -hmm. like for airport transfers. Um, I'm sure I'm, I'm spending probably a little more doing that, but for me, that's like a worthwhile kind of easy button to push because my clients mm -hmm. don't have a ton of interaction with the driver for like point to point services. Yeah. Um, for guides, you know, like, I mean, I would say 90 plus percent of the time for these, the tours that I've led, I um, have met all of the people beforehand. So, you know, guides I generally have met on a research trip um, or, you know, I interview them. We have, you know, Skype or Zoom calls. So I kind of get a sense of their personality. I can kind of talk through the experience I'm looking to create. Um, and so it's kind of, a, you know, if it's a tour company doing like a cooking class or like an activity, normally I've met them on a research trip. So then I kind of have that rapport with them to lean on when it comes to booking the mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing that you were able to sell out your first tour just by word of mouth and Facebook. It was kind of wild. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> at the, I mean, I, it not, I haven't sold, like, there's definitely been a handful of tours I've canceled over the years because... Mm -hmm. They didn't meet the number or a uh, number of times where it's like they don't sell out. And then so that kind of just cuts into your margin, which is yeah. like risk we all take, I'm sure, when we create budgets. It's like you build your budget based on um, a certain number of people, a certain right. amount of income. And then, you know, when suddenly your income's lower and your expenses are generally the same, um, that, that's, a, that's a real uh, yeah. shitty situation. But yeah. I, I often 
I often, when that has happened though, I will try to think of like, okay, well, there's something I'm supposed to learn here. And like, I'll, I will, I try to sit and be like, well, how did I market it? Well, I didn't really do that. Or, you know, I could have done that. And so it's like, mm -hmm. I often think of it as like, okay, well, that was, uh, I guess, a valuable education. Yeah. <laughs> cost of education, so I guess. When you market tours now, like what's kind of your, your marketing process? Like when you launch a trip? Um, when I launch a trip now, well, I guess a couple things. Um, normally on the website, and I actually just launched a new website, so it's a little bit different, but on the last website, I would always publish like anticipated trips. And so for example, <laughs> let's say it's the middle of 2017, you would, you would have been able to see what tours are forecasted for 2018 mm -hmm. um, and even sometimes 19. And so there was always a process built into the site where somebody could essentially kind of raise their hand and say, Hey, I, I'd be, I'm going to be interested in that. Will you let me know mm -hmm. when it's open? Um, and so what I would do is I would, you know, once the websites would be loaded with all the trip content, registration would be open, I would essentially just send an email to all the, the hand raisers for that trip and say, mm -hmm. hey, I want you to be the first to know um, I'm going to be publicly launching this trip in, you know, 24 hours, 40 hours, whatever. And that kind of gave them a heads up on mm -hmm. requesting a spot. So, you know, normally about a third to half of the trips kind of get sold that way because oftentimes people have seen you know, maybe photos from my own research trip, followed on Instagram, you know, for some trips have happened multiple times, you know, like, like Switzerland's a big one where people will say like, oh, I've been following this trip for years. I've just been waiting for it to come back. Mm -hmm. So those people have already decided. Um, but then after that, I would say like the next layer of marketing would be um, kind of email marketing that goes out to like the, the, the list, um, posting it on social media. Mm -hmm. um, I will often um, put like advertising dollars on Facebook just through um, promoted posts um, for that trip. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'll do like one-to-one, -one, like um, let's say I'll stick with Switzerland. I might email all of the women that I've previously traveled to Switzerland with and say, hey, you know, I, I have uh, three spots left, four spots left. If, if, you know, last time you came home, if anyone was, you know, wishing that they could have that same experience, I, I would really be grateful if you wouldn't mind passing this along. So I over, like I started, I think with more traditional marketing and then as kind of the years went by, it started to become more like personal one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. thing to sell the rest of the spots. Yeah. I think that's awesome. And that's something that I think we could all do more of. I mean, it's something that I could do more of for sure. It's definitely time consuming. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know. It's kind of, I think everyone has to make the call of like, yeah. do you spend your dollars or do you spend your time? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's generally one or the other. I mean, no trip just sells out instantly. It's like, it's either from in the moment, I'm investing in time in the coffee chats and all of this, or it's someone that I talked with years prior that's like just now at a point where they're ready to book. And so it, mm -hmm. um, I, I generally prefer that kind of marketing. And for me, it's uh, more satisfying um, to kind of have that connection with people. But it's, yeah, it takes time for sure. Yeah, me too. I've definitely had people email me and be like, I'm interested in Morocco next year. Let me know when it goes live. And I have, and they've booked like right then. And yeah. that's awesome. That's awesome. Cause you know, they've probably been thinking about it, trying to figure out how to save money for yeah. it. Or maybe they forgot about it and me just being like, here are the dates, here's yeah. the link. And yeah. you know, you on your website though, did not make it like you could just buy it like a t-shirt, right? You had them go through a kind of a screening process. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I have to like, I can't use that word screening, but it's, it's essentially kind of what it, it has been. It's like and, a, an interview process, interview. I guess. And so the way it would work is, um, as far as someone could get on the website in, in terms of getting on a trip, was essentially submitting a form saying, hey, I'm serious about wanting this trip. And that would prompt an email to me. And then I would schedule a phone call with them. And normally it was about 30 minutes. Sometimes it would take an hour. So again, it's like time, but it gives me a chance to get a sense of who they are, why they're interested. Um, Cause I can, especially after like hundreds of these calls, like I can kind of sense when there's like a red flag of like, mm -hmm. okay, this person's not you know, based on like their answers, I can tell like they're not maybe going to be ideal in the group setting or mm -hmm. this isn't going to be the trip experience they want. Um, so that was kind of the primary reason. And then the second reason, which more of like from a liability standpoint is it gave me a chance to 
make sure that they understood some of the key things about a trip. And that was like, especially if it's like a heavy hiking trip, if there's a lot of like car time, mm -hmm. um, to make sure they understood that they'd be sharing a room with someone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of my trips are more inclusive than others. And so for some people that's like too much in group time. And so I've just, some of those things that I've learned over time are that are triggers for people, or I hear them say, oh, I didn't realize that we'd be doing this, or I didn't know that. Like right. I can kind of ahead of those things by making sure that they understand those elements mm -hmm. um, and then after the call I would say to them uh, all right I, you know I, I hope I would really love to share this experience with you I'm gonna send you a follow-up email with a link that you'll use to actually register um, and that's where they would submit their deposit and I would like basically hold a spot for them for about 72 hours mm -hmm. um, so for certain trips you know if there's like a lot of interest at once it kind of does become a little bit of a uh, logistic task to to keep organized of kind of who's still in the 70 72 hour window like and then you mm -hmm. know who you call next to schedule those mm -hmm. calls based on who commits and who doesn't yeah what was your um deposit policy like just um for so for every trip except um peru um the deposit was 500 dollars, and that was a non-refundable deposit mm -hmm. and then um after that most clients chose to pay off the balance in installments. And so um, let's say, and could, so let's say for a trip to Italy um, in January, you make a $500 deposit that, and I would set for every trip a payoff date. And so let's mm -hmm. say the payoff date for that Italy trip is August 1st, then I would divide however much was due on the balance of the trip by how many months there were between when they um, made their deposit and a payoff date. And so mm -hmm. I would then apply monthly installment payment charges on the first of every month. And so mm -hmm. a little bit uh, interesting. It, if I were to redo it, I might change it because it ended up being a little bit more manual um, than I originally imagined, especially when the mm -hmm. volume of trips increased. But I think people liked it. Yeah. So the client kind of received after they registered, like, here's what your payment schedule looks like. And then they knew what amount would be um, applied to their credit card on, let's mm -hmm. say, February 1st, March 1st, April 1st, May 1st. And, mm -hmm. all and did you automate that through like Stripe or something? Like, um, or I, 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 use, remembering? I use Stripe. Um, unfortunately, it, the system, the way it's set up, wouldn't allow for those to be automated. And so mm -hmm. um, that was always a pain point. Um, but it ended up being like, too costly to overhaul the system. Yeah. It just like wasn't worth it. And it was just like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm just going to do this on the first of every month. And yeah. So you have to do it. Yeah. I thought about doing that with Gamesley and ultimately I decided just to do a 50% down and then 50% 30 days before the tour. Yeah. So, like that does create some cash flow problems sometimes. Um, yeah. I mean, I've done, I guess early on I did test having like fixed dates for paying off. Um, but the hard part with, for me doing that early on is that I'd have some people would like register and then the, that next date was like 30 days later. And so then I was trying to accommodate them because that was the issue and I didn't want to lose them, you know, as a client. And so it ended up kind of just turning yeah. into a bit more custom anyway. I think in the future I would probably make it more automated. Um, it just hadn't figured the infrastructure echo wasn't there. Yeah, that's the tricky part. <laughs> yeah, I know. Because I have to do it all manually, too. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, but knowing, like, 30 days before, like, I'll usually yeah. send out an email 40 days before and be like, your payment's due within 10 days. Um, and I'm just trying to make that more clear in our, you know, terms and conditions and cancellations policy. I mean, I would say, I'd be curious to hear what the group says, but at least for a lot of like the big tour companies, you know, the REIs, the back roads, blah, blah, blah. I think most of those are at, I think, 60 to 90 days out as final mm -hmm. payment. Yeah. So that kind of helps a bit with cash flow too. Totally. It's so interesting though, because I feel like most clients don't book that far out. Like they're booking, some are, like I have some people who've booked already for, you know, summer of next year, but some clients are booking like a month before. Or two months before so. yeah and, and yeah that that does make it hard when they do yeah. that um, I, I think most of I mean I would say my average client was probably I don't know I would say like 30 I mean I'd have a range of someone between 30 and 60 every mm -hmm. trip so mm -hmm. at my 
it might be the demographic that I feel like most of my clients were excited to like have a vacation on their calendar. And so yeah. they tend to register a little early. Totally. Um, That's awesome. And like the further the trip, you know, like for some reason, like with all the trips to Asia, those trips, people register a lot faster. I mm -hmm. think even though they're similar prices, Europe, I think Europe feels like, mm -hmm. I don't know, like, oh, it's more accessible. I can just book my flight, you know, Whatever, I can go on my like, own. Asia, yeah. people are like, oh, I gotta, I gotta get ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least with my clients, it seemed like that. Yeah, totally. Did you ever do any kind of like incentives to book last minute spots? Um... I didn't do incentives so much for last minute spots. I kind of flipped it. I would do incentives for early registration. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, you know, last year, I think I gave a hundred dollars off if people registered for um, a couple of the trips by the end of the year and it actually worked and people signed up because a lot of people I realized like it was their intention to go. They mm -hmm. were just like too busy or they were, you know, not, I don't know. They just weren't it, what they weren't registering, but when they knew that there was like money to be had, then it was like, Oh, okay. I can take time to go do that. Mm -hmm. and I just realized like, so that was kind of a test. A hundred dollars was kind of the most I've ever done, but it worked. And so, you know, when I look back at like the loss of revenue versus the amount of time or again, money for marketing, I would have had to spend and kind of the uncertainty with whether or not they were sold out. And then it creates more work working with vendors. Cause then you're mm -hmm. like back changing plans. So it, I, I think it was worth it. I mean, I think in the future, if, if, especially if I had like a new trip, a first time trip where there was less certainty about how my audience would react, I would probably do an incentive for those trips just to know that it's sold out. And I think that would make it a lot easier in the planning process. Yeah. Let's talk about list building, email list building. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So I just had a fight with totally. Dainsley. On Dainsley, I did a $100 off coupon if you sign up for our email list. And I've gotten a lot of signups um, pretty consistently. And then I changed it to $50 off. And that's it still hasn't really wavered. We're still getting a lot of signups. $50 yeah. off any trip? Yeah. Cool. Via a pop-up that we had on our site. But, you know, it's always like, how do you build your email list, you know, to get clients? and yeah, I'd love to hear what you think about that, like things that have worked. Yeah, I, you know, I can't say that I think I've been overly creative or successful um, in that. And I, don't, I mean, I don't really know, like, what is a good number? You know, like, I, I think maybe there's, I don't know, maybe four or 5,000 on the list. And mm -hmm. I, so I don't know if that's a lot or none. That's a lot. Yeah, that's is great. It, is yeah. It, and so... Um, I, I've never offered a financial incentive to get people to sign up. Um, I, people kind of signed up organically, you know, like by default, I, I think, well, there's a new website, but I think on the old website, like, you know, anytime you submitted a form, whether it was like requesting a spot, emailing a question, whatever, you know, like there was a box that was like by default check saying I'm signing up. Da, 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 da. So I think a lot mm -hmm. of people just like didn't uncheck the box and they get signed up that way. Mm -hmm. um, what I would do, because I used to do more, I'm going to start doing more trade shows. I used to do a lot more. Um, and people would sign up a lot at trade shows face to face. Um, I would also, I guess the main incentive I'd give people is like to be, you know, to be the first to know about when these trips launch. Because mm -hmm. especially the last couple of years, like they have sold out quick, which is great. And I think um, people kind of responded to that scarcity of like, oh, I, I want to know because especially if someone wanted to go on a trip with like maybe their two sisters or friends or whatever, mm -hmm. it was a little harder to get that many spots. And so, um, I think that kind of worked in my favor, but I, I, I haven't really been super savvy or smart, I would say on <laughs> email building a list. Yeah. I mean, you have though, cause that's a, that's a pretty impressive list. And if you have a, a trip with 12 people and you're sending it out to 5,000, well, I mean, that's the odds are pretty good, you know? Yeah. So, well, thanks. I you know, I would say also, I'm trying to remember, um, when maybe, let's see, years, maybe like 2004, no, 2016, 17, um, I decided to kind of test a new marketing tactic and I went with hiring a publicist. Mm -hmm. And um, cause when I, in my marketing background at Tillamook, I, I managed the PR program. And so like, I, I understood enough about how to work, how it works and how to manage it and resources. Mm -hmm. And, um, a friend of mine is a publicist. And so 
she had started doing more and more work in the travel space, but for like really big clients. And so I just asked her, I was like, look, I can't afford a whole lot, but like, could I, could we do this for four months or six months or something and just kind of see how it goes. And like, because also I was curious to see what elements of the story people res like resonated mm -hmm. with media. And so it was, I learned a lot from that. And so in all of the stories that were published as a result of those PR efforts, those also generated a lot of site visits, which mm -hmm. converted also into um, email signups. So. Right, right. What do you think the stories, like what were the themes that you were seeing and what the press was writing about you? Because I think that's such an interesting experiment to do when you're trying to figure out like exactly what your business is. Yeah, you know, um, it was interesting because you, at that, age, I mean, at that point, you know, like you were doing the conference, which was a big and always in the news and still is, but there, there weren't as many like women companies. Mm -hmm. I mean, even yeah, last, totally. like, three years, there's been like a huge surge. And mm -hmm. so it felt, I think a little more, um, I don't know, unique in, um, but the people weren't writing about the trips, which mm -hmm. is really interesting. That was interesting for me. What they were most interested about would be stories about my personal pivot from the corporate world to starting a business. Interesting. Uh, they were really curious about what women want, like in terms of travel. Um, every now and then, you know, people would like for kind of low hanging fruit stories, they would just want travel tips. And so, and just like, they would treat me as almost just like a thought leader and in, in a roundup article, um, which is great too, because it was all, you know, mentioned the company name. But more often than not, they were curious about starting a business, like entering the travel world, um, and making a leap to change a career. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the most like pivotal marketing thing is like that I had ever experienced is as a result of these PR efforts, um, the Huffington Post actually contacted, um, the, the PR firm and they wanted to interview me and they weren't really sure what the article is going to be, but it was for a new content series. I think they still have it around called like making the leap or making the mm -hmm. jump. Mm -hmm. like that. Um, well at the time I was in Italy cause I had about six weeks between tours. And so I just like rented a little studio apartment in Florence. And so they really thought that was cool. And so they said, Oh, well, we're going to hire, um, someone in Italy to go and can they meet with Mary while she's there? And, and I was like, like, oh. <laughs> like it was just like the biggest crazy thing that came to my little apartment. And, um, anyway, it was fun, but that was, I think probably the most like significant thing that, um, mm -hmm. Uh, help the business and and what was cool about it is like it shifted I think my relationships my conversations with clients and potential mm -hmm. clients because it was no longer just um, a surface level like service that I was mm -hmm. offering people wanted to be a part of I think a larger culture associated with the brand um, and they they were asking more questions about me personally that like the first like year or two like I just never really shared that because I was like well mm -hmm. no, they're spending money to go to Sorry, they're spending money to like see this place, not to hear right what I used to do for a living. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really eye opening of like, oh wow, like you know people people I think were attracted to the smallness of the brand. people mm -hmm. were attracted to like the human nature of it. Like I didn't need to talk in third person. I didn't need to present this image on the website that mm -hmm you know, like, oh, there's this whole team of people. Cause it's like, yeah. no, like I'm literally the one like, you know, yeah. paying the bills and cleaning up the email and like, you know, do it at the airport. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> doing all this stuff. yeah, like you told me that story. Mm -hmm. um, so I think then that helped me understand like, oh, people are actually attracted to that. That's not a weakness. Right. Or a lack of experience or size. It's actually like, Mm -hmm. gave me a lot more comfort and confidence to say like, you know, I don't need to, I don't need to be the female Rick Steves. In fact, I don't, cause I was never attracted to that. And like, I don't, I don't, my measure of success is not going to be measured by how big I make this or how many trips I do. It's going to be connected to like, is this company delivering on a lifestyle that I want? Mm -hmm, totally. So at what point did you start hiring other tour leaders? Cause it must be really hard when you're running them all yourself and you realize like, you're so attached to the brand and clients expect to see you. This is something that I'm going through right now as I'm, I'm bringing on other tour leaders because I need to take a more administrative role. So, yeah, it's, it's hard. I mean, finding them was really hard mm -hmm. um, because a lot of people, I'm sure we all see this, like a lot of people think the work is dreamy and, and, and they say it to me, I'm sure they say it to you like, Oh my God, you have the dream job. And yeah. I, 
And I, and in some ways I, it, I do, I feel that I, I know what it's like to be in an office. So I'm like, I'm not going to do that anymore. Yeah. Um, but just because somebody loves to travel doesn't make them um, necessarily the right candidate for a trip mm -hmm. post. Um, so finding them was hard, uh, but once I did identify a couple people, I actually brought them on trips with me. And so, yeah. um, for example, I work with a woman uh, named Katie. Uh, Katie's the trip host I work with. Um, the first trip Katie hosted on her own was in Iceland. And so before she ever did that, she came with me when I hosted a trip to Iceland. Mm -hmm. So she got to not only, um, cause she had been there many times. So it's not like I'm teaching her anything about the destination. She's right. just seeing it through kind of the lens I've created for clients, meeting all the partners, you know, help for all of the women on that trip to, mm -hmm. to meet Katie and to see how cool she is and to mm -hmm. see, and like imagine her in that hosting role. So again, as those women became advocates for other women to mm -hmm. sign up for next year and join Katie in Iceland, Katie kind of had this, started having this like built-in network of cheerleaders. Um, I also try really hard to kind of build them up um, in social media or email or on the website and just kind of to, to help underscore how much faith I have in them mm -hmm. um, and how much trust and how exciting it is. And frankly, I think it's, <laughs> I think they're more fun to lead. <laughs> than yeah, I do. Right? I'm like worried about the money and you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know, totally. like, so they're having a good time. And so it's definitely like those trips still take, I'm not going to say longer. I mean, it's, but people are definitely like a little bit more cautious. They're like, Oh, I, my friend went with you to that place and now you're right. not leading it. And so I, I kind of have to like, move through that but um I used to be more afraid of, of it or anxious about it and I think it's now not so much issue because I think people yeah. understand how cool they are and I know I I just on my last tour last weekend I trained someone to take over that trip and mm -hmm. I kind of got emotional like when I was when we when I was talking to them about actually handing it over because it's like it's my baby I built it from scratch it was our first tour that we ever did and I you know and I'm like, but I have to yeah. step aside in order to be able to grow the business. Yeah, it's definitely like a, a super um, challenging internal thing. For, mm -hmm. I know. For, I, I would say one thing that gave me a lot of comfort, because then it's going to be a whole nother box of emotions when she, or, you know, I'm assuming she, when she's hosting that trip and you're, you know, at home, not there, yeah. and you're seeing everyone's photos on Instagram, you're like, on one hand, you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. Look at everyone's having fun and they're enjoying it. Um, and the other hand, you're like, oh, but it's, I'm not, I don't know. You kind of go through this whole thing. Every five minutes. <laughs> yes. But one thing that I've found um, has given me comfort when other people host is um, I kind of set expectations with them about how often I'd like them to check in. And it's not often because I know how hard that job is, but mm -hmm. you know, like I'll say, okay, if, if these types of situations, da, 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 if these things happen, that's when I need you to call me. Mm -hmm. um, or please like call what? me if, like if someone's sick. Yeah, I often, it's like if, if, um, if there's an accident, if someone's sick, if someone's really dissatisfied with something, um, and not that they can't handle that on their own, but I know how helpful it is to be able to talk something out with someone. Mm -hmm. um, or also like, you know, like a couple of years ago in Iceland, Katie had an issue where there was like a threat of a flood that would have completely flooded out the road they needed to take the next morning to get back to the airport. And so, you know, when Katie put that on my radar, I told her, you know, I said, okay, well, you go do your job, go host, take them dinner, whatever she was doing. And I will try to problem solve and think of different like solutions or mm -hmm. our plan B's, our plan C's. And so I'm able to kind of help support her when those new things come up. Um, so she can kind of keep doing what she needs to do. Yeah. Um, totally. so that's, that's, yeah, but you know, they're there to have fun and, um, I can see on social media and we use a photo sharing app so I can see all the client photos and mm -hmm. get a sense of how things are going. And, um, what app do you use? I'm curious. Photo sharing. Oh my God, it's a great app. It's called photo circle. Photo circle. It's free. And I'm not sure why no one's charging me for it yet, but <laughs> I'm sure they're like awkwardly selling your photos. But um, essentially it's like a, a shared photo album. So you, you download the app, I create the photo album, um, and then I send a text invite to all of the women on the trip. And then when they click on the link, it, if they've already downloaded Photo Circle, then it opens up into the photo album and then everybody can upload their photos and also download other people's photos. Oh, that's fun. But it's like really 
I mean, it started out as like a necessity because like, like it was throwing off every day when we would be in a group setting to take a photo and we had to give someone like 12 iPhones. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, we literally actually are running out of time because we're trying to accommodate. Right. <laughs> so many photos. So when that happens, it's kind of like we tell people up front, like how it works. We're like, okay, we'll give this person, you know, my cell phone mm -hmm. or the post cell phone and then I just upload it and then yeah. everyone is fine. Yeah. I, I do that too, but with Google Drive. Yeah. That one, um, I did try it once and it, for some reason, like half the people got it and half the people were like really overwhelmed by it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's such a good idea, though. Cool. Well, you know, I don't want to take up too, too much of your time, but as you're nearing your last trip, how are you feeling with your business transitioning? And Yeah, um, bittersweet for sure. Um, so as a bit of background, I guess, to anyone watching, um, I announced earlier this summer that 2019 was going to be the last year for hosted groups. Um, I'll probably come back with them in a couple years. That's my full intention. But um, I've just been traveling so much the last couple of years. So to be honest, I'm just, I'm burnt out. Like I'm burnt out. Um, my husband, I just got married last year. My husband and I are interested in, I think, starting a family. And um, for a while I was trying to figure out, you know, like, okay, I can do this trip and then hopefully I get pregnant. And, and like, it just, it like wasn't really, I mean, that's, I guess not how it works actually. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So I'm excited to take a couple of years, I think, to kind of be a little bit more uh, closer to home and to kind of focus on that phase of my life. I mean, this business is my first child, so like it's kind of, I'm ready to, mm -hmm. um, to you know, share that. Um, so in the meantime, I, I guess over the next couple of years, I'll just focus exclusively on the private travel design. And in fact, the new website that just came out um, is exclusively about travel design. Um, and that's like more than full-time work because it, it's yeah. grown quite fast. And so that'll be good. Um, it also, I think it'll give me some time to um, like be thoughtful and strategic about what I want the future of hosted travel to look like, both in my world and for my clients and um, for the business. Mm -hmm. I just feel like the last couple of years, it's just been like this constant sprint to try to keep up that I'm not... I just didn't, I don't know, I, maybe that's just my background as a marketer, but like I want to be able to sit back and really think critically about the brand and how it serves people and um, how it serves me. So mm -hmm. anyway, I'm excited to do that and maybe over the next couple of years also test some concepts for different styles of trips or different audiences. And mm -hmm. so yeah, it's hard. Like my, my final trip is in about three weeks in Italy um, and it is, it's hard to think it's the end, but actually I just booked my, my trip and I'm going to take a couple days in Italy on my own at the end yeah. to just kind of sit with it for a mm -hmm. while and I don't know process it before I just come mm -hmm. home and get back That's to work good for you I mean I'm in I'm in the same boat you know I think a lot of us are actually but I, we don't really talk about it so much because it's like you don't want to I don't know there's like a fear for me at least of getting off the train and then being like completely irrelevant <laughs> like so <laughs> I'm afraid of that all the time, but I also know that like right now I'm trying to do the work to set myself up to not have to be traveling yeah. all the time because, you know, if I want to have kids in the next couple of years or even have a relationship, like that yeah. takes time and investment, you know, my last relationship just ended because I'm gone for a, a month. So, and he was like, it's too long. And I mean, that's like, that's yeah. part of it. So well, I mean, that's a complex one, right? But because. Yeah, but, but I, I'm saying like, you got to do what's best for you. And I think you're making the right move because you're not just getting out of the industry. You're just shifting your offerings. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And I think it's like, it's, it's helpful to talk about. I, I, um, I don't know if I told you this when we met for coffee, but I was like a few weeks ago, I was so nervous to tell you that I was transitioning the business because I just, I was just, not that you would say it, but I was, I guess I think of you as like this mega star in the women's travel world. And I was just like, oh my God, like, she's going to look at me like I'm an idiot. Like, not at all. Because like the trips have sold out and like, I'm, I'm proud of that and excited about it. And like, I sometimes feel like, oh my God, I'm going to get judged because I'm walking away from that. And so when you were like, I want to do that too. I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> I'm like, like, you're my hero. That's exactly my goal too. Well, and you know, but like no one says that, like, yeah. cause I, I think, I guess I, maybe I'm creating it, but 
my senses there's a lot because I get a lot of you know I'm sure we all get emails saying like how do I get into this work and that's my dream job and so I feel a lot of I think shame in walking away from what other people think is really cool yeah but at a certain you know point and maybe it's just as our lives transition it like has a diminishing return mm -hmm. or because what we need is changing you know yeah. like when I started this business at 25 or whatever it was rad I was like literally getting to travel without spending money and like making a little money. And, and now like that's still rad, don't get me wrong, but um, you know, I'm excited to be able to show up and support my nieces, nephews and my aging parents and uh, my friends at their baby showers, you know, like yeah. I have value Live life. Yeah. Yeah. I Being home on weekends good. to mm -hmm. you know, go do the things. Yeah. Uh, like invest in your relationships. Yeah. And that's, I think that's like, that's the goal, I think. That should be everyone's goal, is to build a business that, you know, fulfills us. And when we get to a point where it's no longer meeting our life's priorities, we either have to transition out or shift the focus of what we offer. And so yeah. it's great that you're offering, you know, customized trips. Because hey, I'm sure you get a lot it. of people who are like, I want to go to Japan. And you're like, okay, let me sit down and plan an awesome trip for you in Japan and not actually have to be there holding yeah. their hands, you know, taking them to dinner. Yeah. So I think it's rad. It's super How inspiring. much small talk? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How much small talk? Yeah, I know. You know, that would be a good, actually, question to pose to the group of, like, what are the things that you bring up in conversations, you know, when it's, like, that awkward silence at dinner, when it's, yeah. like... Or long car rides. <laughs> yeah, like car games, or <laughs> I feel like I'm always running out of, like, oh, my God, Mary, just think of something interesting to stimulate a conversation. Me too. And then that, lately, like, just, the energy. Yeah, and lately I've just been like, you know what? I'm just going to not do that, and I'm just going <laughs> to you guys fill the silence. And that's also been really nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, that's good. I, I I've always like, I got to keep them talking, and now I'm like, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've, I've only happened like maybe once or twice where I have a group of like almost all introverted silent people and that is hard. Mm -hmm. There's normally like a couple people that are kind of like, you know, super social, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, it's really hard when you have that kind of a group. But, you know, in the end, they really start to come out of their shells, I feel like, and yeah. it can also be really rewarding. Um, I don't know. I'm still, you know, I'm still new to this whole thing. Oh, so. no, no, maybe just a new, new, new chapter, but not new. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time and for sharing this with us. And yeah, yeah I think no, we can all learn a lot from each other and we've all learned a lot from you. So oh, thank you. Well, thanks for just putting this group together. And, um, I think it's such a cool idea and I, I, um, I'm always like struggling of how to like have less screen time. Uh, but I, when I get back to this next trip, I'm going to prioritize my screen time <laughs> more than just within the Facebook group. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, but I'd love to help support and like meet up and um, just be able to lean on this community for help and also support if there's other things I know or can help with. So yeah, anyway. totally. Yeah. All right, lady. Well, thank you so, so much. Big travels to Morocco. Thank can you. We follow the photos. <laughs>